We can pick it up where we stopped. So basically, remember what we did before the break. We talked about FSO as a potential technology for uh, several applications. Obviously, this technology suffers from uh, a few problems and challenges. So we, we, we talked about these problems, and we offered some solutions that have been used in the literature to address these problems. So now, the second part of the talk, which can take about probably an hour, is to go uh, through an overview of some of the kind of research uh, results that we were able to kind of obtain over the last uh, year and a half. And some of them are really directly connected to FSO. Some others are actually more general results that can be connected somehow to FSO. I was answering a Najib question earlier, telling me, why did you get into FSO? And the answer is very simple. FSO uh, is uh, research depends a lot on feeding, a lot of interesting problems in performance analysis, and I'm more interested in using the kind of tools we developed over the years to solve uh, problems that are related to FSO. And that's why you will see that some of the research results that we, we have here are applicable to FSO, but actually are more generally applicable even to RF, because it's just a question of changing the distribution of the fading to be able to get a result for an RF channel. So the first uh, problem we looked at was trying to unify some of the results uh, that were published in the FSO topic, dealing with the performance uh, of uh, FSO over uh, different kind of uh, scintillation uh, channels and including the pointing error and accounting for different type of detections. And then there is problems related to the capacity computation over fading channels and some other problems related to the average probability computation over also fading channels that I would like to put in the context of FSO. And uh, I will probably not talk about the two last problems, but I will talk just because it was a question asked earlier, how can we use uh, FSO in the context of cellular, and we have some proposed some solutions, and we did some analysis or performance analysis of these solutions uh, uh, for basically applying FSO over uh, uh, for cellular technology. So the first contribution is uh, this kind of unified PDF. I will tell you exactly how you get this result, but the motivation behind this problem is. Uh, if you look at papers, there has been a lot of uh, papers written on the performance of FSO links point to point, accounting for pointing errors or accounting for this kind of detections, but there is not single framework that accounts for basically pointing error, different kind of fading, and different kind of uh, uh, detection types. So this formula here is unified in the sense that we have a single PDF formula for signal to noise ratio accounting for a uh, gamma gamma fading, which is as I told you, very popular in the context of fading, and you see the parameter alpha and beta that I talked about earlier, and that's in red. You have also the Xi parameter that quantifies the pointing error. I told you earlier, when Xi goes to infinity, you have no pointing error. As Xi grows smaller, you start getting more and more pointing error. And R basically accounts for the type of detection. R is a number that is either equal to one or two, and based on the number one or two, you have heterodyne detection, or you have basically uh, uh, direct detection. So this formula unifies many formulas that were obtained before, and it's not very complicated. What we did is just a very simple uh, problem dealing with uh, algebra of random variable, if you will. What we deal with is basically a gamma gamma is a product of two gamma. You multiply that by another random variable that accounts for the pointing error. You raise that to the power r, where r can be equal either to one or two, depending on the type of detection. And it happens that this product of three random variables raised to the power r can be solved in closed form for the PDF in terms of the Meijer function. Okay, uh, and that, that's not, uh, I mean, of course when it works you are always happy and you think it's easy. Uh, it was not hard, it, it's easy, but it, we were lucky that it was able to be worked out in close form even for this kind of general unified model. Now, 
Some people would argue, I don't know how many of you have been using the G functions, but there is sometimes some resistance uh, against these special functions, right? A lot of reviewers, and I would say some people in uh, maybe uh, some uh, uh, some researchers in, within even communication uh, will be very reluctant to accept this as a closed form because they would consider the G function as being a very complicated function by itself. Uh, and my answer always to that, and I would have uh, three answers actually. First of all, it's a special function that is recognized as a special function. You'll find it in the table of integers like the Gratsch and Rizik. So it'll be always either applied mathematicians or people who are specialized in special function who will come up with sophisticated algorithms Algorithms to compute accurately this, this function. So you always are better when you express your expression, when you express your formulas in terms of basically closed form, even if they are in terms of G or H complicated functions. But more and the second interesting argument is that the G function has uh, an interesting asymptotic expansion that is very simple and that basically will work in our scenarios in high, as a, in high SNR. And you will see later on that just using this expansion of the G, so basically what I'm trying to say, you develop an expression in, for FSO or for RF, and you end up with an extension expression in terms of G function. Fine, that's an exact expression. People may argue that's a complicated function, but you can have an asymptotic expansion for the G function that is very simple, and it can give you accurate result at high SNR, and that involves only finite sums. And then the third argument behind the G function, especially when you have a PDF in terms of G function, is that there is a very interesting theorem, melan barnes theorem, which tells you when you need to average over a G function, and when you average another function that can be expressed as G function, if the parameters are set properly, this integral that involves the product of two G function is itself another G function, which means you can do a lot of averaging like, for example, you need a beta rate average, or you need a capacity average, or you need, uh, you know, uh, an out probability, which is not an average, but basically an integral over G function. Many of these integrals can be obtained in another closed form, another, in terms of another G function. So having a G functions as a starting point can allow you to get another G function that sometime you are lucky can be simplified to a more familiar function. Because the G function, once you set up the parameter properly, can become a Bessel function or a gamma function or an, even sometimes an exponential function if it is with the right simple parameters. So this was the first results uh, that we were able to obtain. Uh, you know, this result basically simplifies to well-known results that were available previously in the literature where people considered no pointing error with, for example, uh, uh, heterodyne detection, or here pointing error with heterodyne detection, uh, all kind of other combination can be obtained as a special case of this simplified formula. Now, with this formula at hand, we try to look, for instance, at uh, ergodic capacity, and that's what I was talking about. So you're, you need to average the log one of plus gamma, which is the capacity, over the G function. The log one plus gamma can be written as a G function. You can use the Menon Barnes theorem, and you can end up with another G function for the capacity. Now, obviously, this is again a generic expression. It's a function of xi, of alpha and beta and r, so it accounts for all kind of scenarios. And you can plot it exactly. But on the top of that, and that's, uh, as I told you, the most interesting part of the exercise, is that you can develop the asymptotic expression that does not involve any special function except just simple gamma functions. And this is a multiple term expression that you can further simplify if you basically focus on the dominant term, you can end up with basically a single uh, exp uh, term expression which is extremely simple. And actually this formula we are using it for FSO but it's much more generic. What we were able to show that Similar to basically the asymptotic expression we have for the beta rate. When people talk about beta rate, we have we know we have a very simple formalism to write the beta rate uh, formula for high SNR. We talk about like the paper, for example, by Wang and Genax, where they develop the notion of, of coding gain and diversity gain. So what you write usually is the coding uh, gain divided by gamma bar raised to the diversity gain, right? And you give usually the, your coding gain and diversity gain that dictates basically the performance from probability of error perspective. What, this, what you can think of this formula, in my opinion, is a very equivalent formula for capacity. What you can show over a multitude of fading channels, the capacity can be written at high SNR as log of the SNR plus another constant that actually is function only of the, uh, in, in our paper uh, I can share with you, derivative of the moments, 
uh, of uh, the SNR. And this is independent of the SNR. It's basically function only of the feeding parameter. So if you notice here, it's log of gamma bar plus the detection parameter, the feeding parameter, the pointing error parameter. Now, at low SNR, it's well known that the first moment can usually be used as a good approximation for the capacity. So we have asymptotic results for the capacity that we were able to compute exactly. So if you look here, just as a, as a way to validate our results, we have here expression for the capacity for two kinds of pointing errors. So basically here is for strong turbulence conditions. So alpha and beta were picked for strong uh, turbulence conditions. And we have two pointing error kind of parameters. So we have here uh, basically uh, not that much of pointing error, I think 6.7. So it's, it's, it's a good from a pointing error perspective, the magenta curve here. And then the green curve here is basically for uh, quite strong pointing error, like maybe 1.2 or something like this for C. So you see there is degradation in capacity just because of the pointing error. And now that's the green and magenta curve were compute exactly based on the G function results. Now, if you use asymptotic results, basically if you focus only on the dominant term, you see basically the, the, the very simple formula I mentioned to you, log of gamma bar plus a constant, that's function only of the fading parameters, you get these asymptotes that converge quite nicely beyond, I would say, 25 dB or so to the exact results. So what I'm trying to say, the G function, yes, they can give the exact result. They may be complicated, although they are now available in mathematical software like Mathematica. But you can also use very simple asymptotic results that you can deduce from these uh, uh, more complicated exact results to get exact uh, and asymptotic results for the capacity of FSO links over gamma gamma, accounting for different kind of detection and accounting for pointing errors. Now you can do the same exercise but here for weak turbulence conditions, so we just change alpha and beta, and we are just showing that our results are still as good in terms of accuracy from an asymptotic perspective. And the exact results shows you, again, even in weak turbulence condition, the pointing error is considerable, uh, uh, has a considerable impact on the capacity, since here the two chosen capacity, uh, a pointing error 6.7, 1.2, can give a, a big difference in capacity. Now at low capacity, uh, sorry, at low SNR, also the capacity result can be computed exactly with the G function and the asymptotic result using the uh, first moment approximation uh, is quite accurate. As you see, it converged to the right results. Now, actually, we just uh, capitalized on the same formalism to revisit, and as I told you, FSO was an opportunity for us to look again at some of the open problems in fading channels. One of the well-known, is not I would not say an open problem, but it's a problem that has not been fully solved, is the capacity of log normal fading. It's very simple. Log normal is a very simple uh, you know, distribution. You know what log normal is, right? It's uh, used in RF also. But the problem, it is not, it's simple in terms of defining it, but it is not very uh, uh, handy if you want to use it for performance analysis. Like you, you, we don't have exact results, for example, for the beta rate calculation over log normal. Uh, we don't have exact results for the capacity over log normal channels. So uh, what we did here is we tried to look at uh, an expression that is closed form, uh, but asymptotic for the capacity of log normal channels. Uh, 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 and we, we were able to get this very simple expression. And we account even for the pointing error. So we have a log normal fading, but we have also pointing error random variables. So it's a product of two random variables. And we were still able to get a very simple closed form expression at high SNR and low SNR. The exact expression cannot be obtained in closed form. It has to be done in actually double integral, because you have to account for the pointing error, and you have to account for the uh, log normal, but basically the asymptotic result is quite simple. It's again log of the SNR plus a factor that is accounting for the uh, detection type, the pointing error, and the sigma, which is the shadowing, I mean, uh, the shadow standard deviation if you are talking about shadowing, or the uh, scintillation index if you are talking about the FSO. And for, uh, for low SNR, again, you can find the first moment, and the result is quite simple. Now. You can look at how accurate these results here again. Uh, the, the, the exact results were computed using uh, basically uh, numerical integration. The asymptotic results, and uh, you know, actually, uh, the, these are the, asymptotic, the exact results the, by simulation of numerical integration are obtained here. These are the blue sky, and the asymptotic results that are the, the, the asymptote the lines are converging very nicely to the exact results beyond 10 dB. There is no much difference between the exact result and the uh, asymptotic result. And this is true for high SNR and low SNR. 
Now, another important aspect when you look at capacity, and that's, I think, a result that I presented earlier uh, here, in, uh, maybe at Subcom, or I'm, I'm not sure, but that's something we have been looking at quite extensively over the last years, is essentially uh, the notion of low SNR capacity. This is an important topic. Uh, at high SNR, the difference in capacity between having child data formation transmit and receiver is not that important. I think I mentioned it once in a, in, a, in a setting similar to that probably a couple of years ago. But at low SNR, having child state information at the transmitter is crucial and can give you a huge gain. Uh, and for this reason, uh, there has been some work trying to characterize the capacity at low SNR. Uh, now, the first work was done by, actually, the initial work was done by Goldsmith and Varaya in 1994. They have this kind of uh, first paper trying to look at the channel state information, uh, sorry, at the capacity over fading channel with full channel state information, and the capacity in terms of this cutoff SNR gamma naught, where below the SNR you don't transmit, above the SNR you transmit. But in this paper, there is no characterization of the SNR dependence or how the SNR scale with respect to SNR, uh, how the capacity scales with respect to SNR at low SNR. The first time it was mentioned, it was this paper by Boran and Zhang in 2010, where they were able to show that the capacity at low SNR is SNR log one over SNR. Now, if you don't have child state information, it's very, uh, you know, it's not well known that the capacity scales at SNR. It's very simple because at low SNR, log of one plus SNR becomes SNR, uh, even in, in fading environment. So at low SNR, without chance state information, C equal SNR. If you have chance state information, it becomes SNR log one over SNR. And that's the gain that you get by getting chance state information. And the smaller is the SNR, the higher is this factor because log of one SNR is going to grow with SNR going to zero. And that's what was mentioned in the paper by Verdun in 2002, where he was saying that this gain is going to grow you know, uh, and, and increase considerably as SNR go to low, uh, low regimes. But this formula was valid only for Rayleigh fading. Okay? What we were able to show, actually, recently, and there is Fatma, she, she was a student at Ecole Polytechnique, and she, she looked at this problem extensively over the last couple of years. She characterized the capacity of log normal and gamma gamma. And in both cases, she was able to get very nice close form expressions. Uh, I input them here, just, you know, they are simple, actually, but they, they can be quite, uh, uh, the log normal one is quite simple, but I, I chose not to put it. But I can give you the reference of these two expressions. But basically, uh, she has an expression similar to this one, where she has basically a character, full characterization of the capacity of log normal in the context of FSO, it's very important, and gamma gamma, again, in the context of FSO. Uh, and uh, this paper has been published already, the gamma gamma, the log normal is still following the review process. And I can show you some results. So here, uh, some of the results that she obtained. So basically, what you have here is a capacity as function of SNR. What you have as a benchmark, the black curve here is the capacity without channel state information. And again, this is at low SNR. When we say low is low, it's like zero and below. Okay? So basically, no channel state information, you have the black curve. And then the basically ergodic capacity with perfect CSI, the one computed numerically after numerical optimization, is because uh, we don't have a closed form expression for log normal fading, is a black curve that is hidden here. Okay, continuous black curve. Now, if you look at the expression she came up with, she came up with two expressions. One in terms of Lambert function, and that gives you a close approximation. And then if you use the first approximation, or what they call the first ladder approximation of the Lambert function in terms of log function, you end up with another approximation, which is still quite good. So basically, what you notice here is, the, this is the gain. First of all, we characterize the gain in terms of capacity you get by chance state information at the transmitter at low SNR, and indeed is growing as the SNR goes down. And more importantly, I mean, from our perspective, what is important is that we were able also to get close form, simple formula for the capacity with a Lambert function or with a log function, and both are quite accurate when you compare them with the exact results. So that was one problem that we looked at in the context of basically capacity of fading channels. So in this case, we used basically asymptotic results uh, to basically uh, determine the capacity either at low SNR or high SNR. The second kind of problems we looked at, uh, again, connect to FSO and uh, basically uh, trying to compute the capacity of a certain link. 
But in this case, we didn't use asymptote, we didn't use approximation, we used bounds. Okay? So what I'm trying to convey as part of this kind of flash of different research results, at the end, you are trying to compute a certain performance metric. Let's say in this particular case, an average capacity or an ergodic capacity. And sometimes what is easier is to find asymptotic results. Sometimes what's easier is to find bounds. Sometimes what's easier is to find exact results. Uh, but it's maybe sometimes a little bit complicated. But the approach that you use will change depending on the problems. You cannot guess what is be, be the best approach up front. But you know, at the end, you can basically uh, depending on the problem at hand, device, or find the best tool to solve the problem. So this problem came, and, and probably some of you are familiar with a different version of this problem in a different context. Uh, it can be motivated in the following fashion. When you talk about FSO communications, and as I told you earlier, you may need to work on a mesh network that will use route diversity, which route diversity, which means you have multiple options in front of you, and depending on the traffic condition, depending on the channel condition, you may choose one route, versus another. Uh, in the context of multi-user diversity or RF, you will be, for example, picking the best channel to communicate because that will be the most reliable channel over which you can transmit at the highest possible data rate. Now, in the context of FSO, uh, because sometime, and actually this, we were not the first one to advocate for that, there was some papers, up, uh, you know, this paper appearing in GLT in 2012, uh, and even in the FSO, uh, in the non-FSO context, the key idea was here that sometime you uh, you will be uh, asked not to pick the best path. So you know, let's just to kind of put the paper or the, the topic in its context. You have multiple paths in front of you or multiple routes. Each route will have its own SNR. Obviously, the natural choice is to pick the route with the best SNR because that will be the, the more reliable and the most reliable path. And sometimes you have to go through a relay after that. Now, what happens is sometimes this path that has the highest SNR is not the best path from an end-to-end -end perspective because maybe the next path here uh, and you have a multi-hop communication is not that good or is congested so you may have to go for the second best path or because maybe this relay is busy with other processing other kind of information or not available at that particular time so this the first time this has been kind of proposed is a paper by Salama Iki where he called this the kth best selection scheme where you're not using the best path at any given time but you pick the second best third best fourth best depending on other constraints now that's the general context text of the paper. Now, we, saw, we, we kind of wrote a paper on this, and it was a little bit complicated. I'm not going to talk about this paper, actually, because this was trying to solve exactly the problem of picking the best, second best, third best, using a gamma gamma and log normal uh, fading for this very specific uh, fading distribution or scintillation distribution. It ended up being a very tedious and complicated kind of analysis that uh, nonetheless were interesting because they were exact. However, what we worked on here is uh, with the uh, uh, two uh, collaborators, Muhammad Hanif and Hong Shuang Yang. Uh, Hong Shuang is, uh, was my former PhD student. He is now a uh, faculty member at University of Victoria. And we are involved in a joint project, uh, uh, SRI. We call that SRI at Kaos project. So he comes and spends uh, part of the summer uh, at Kaos. So we looked at two problems. So basically, the problem we looked at is trying to characterize basically the capacity of, uh, of this so-called Kth best selection scheme in a generic fashion. And the problem is quite simple. What we are trying to find is trying to average, again, the log over an order statistics kind of distribution instead of only the best, but the second best, third best, fourth best. And we want to do that not only for ergo capacity without chance state information at the transmitter, but also when you have chance state uh, information at the transmitter. And that's why you have the gamma naught here that is involved in the cutoff uh, you know, transmission rate. And now we know how to compute these all the statistics PDF, basically, it is just function of the CDF and PDF of the original random variable that you are trying to rank. But obviously, often uh, this is not very, uh, I mean, you can always compute things numerically, and that's not a problem. You can always, for any distribution, find the PDF, find the CDF, inject that here, and try to compute that in close form, uh, not in close form, numerically. But uh, if you want to get some close form, generic close form expression. There is an interesting approach that we, uh, Hanif actually goes credits to him. This is the students who worked on the problem with the Hong Shuan, uh, uh, over the last summer. So basically the idea here is to use certain uh, convexity properties of uh, this kind of function. The inverse CDF of Y and X. Our interest is to find actually all the statistics of X. 
We use, first of all, Jensen equality. So we are trying to find the expected value of log 1 plus x n minus k plus 1. Use Jensen equality to be able, basically, just to resume the problem of finding the expected value of a certain order statistics. Now, it happens that not all expected value of order statistics are obtainable in a simple cross form, even just the average. But if you have the convexity of this, you can basically convert, use here f minus 1 of x, and just find the expected value of another order statistics that, if chosen carefully, can give you a tight bound on what you would like to compute, but also can be computed in close form. It turns out that for a large uh, uh, class or family of distribution, if we use the exponential distribution as a bounding distribution, you can find very interesting closed form expression and tight, and you will see the results. So basically, and then this inequality can be reversed if you pick basically a convex, uh, you know, like basic of convex or concave function, you can reverse this inequality, which means you can find an upper bound and a lower bound on the statistics that you are like to compute. Now, just to make a long story short, this paper uh, is going to appear maybe this month or next month in transaction, not transaction, communication letter, it's a short letter. It's based on this main theorem, and then it uses this theorem to compute the capacity. And the formula that uh, you know, we came up with is very simple. The ergodic capacity is bounded by an upper bound and lower bound, where the upper bound is given by this formula and the lower bound by this formula. So if you look at the lower bound, it's very simple. It's just the bandwidth B, log 2, 1 plus F minus 1, N minus K over N. K is the order, like the second best or third best. N is the total number of views you are picking. And F minus 1 is what? F minus 1 is the inverse function of the CDF, which we call the quantile function. You know, the quantile. And the quantile, you can find in closed form, for example, for the, for the uh, it's not, even it's not a closed form, like for Weeble distribution or gamma distributions in closed form or exponential distributions in closed form. For other distribution, even if it's not in closed form, it's already programmed in MATLAB. If you go to MATLAB, for example, the inverse of the R function, the inverse of the incomplete function are available already in MATLAB. So it's a very simple function. The upper bound is exactly the same form. You just change uh, basically the second term here or the argument of the f minus 1, instead of 1 minus k minus n, is 1 minus exponential, the harmonic number, divided k minus 1 divided by h, h of n. So it's a very, uh, I mean, uh, simple uh, formula. Uh, originally, we thought that it's going to be maybe loose because we are using Jensen inequality, then another bound on the top of that. But when you compare the result, the results are quite interesting. So our benchmark was a paper written by these co-authors. It was published in 2009, and these paper, these uh, paper, you know, you know, co-authors, they looked only at the best algorithm. Uh, as a, just the best, and trying to find the b upper bound only. And that's the black curve that you see here. What you notice with our approach, not only we outperform, with the, because our approach is blue for the upper bound, and red as a, uh, sorry, and green as a lower bound. So the green, sorry, let me repeat. The, the red is exact. That's computed numerically or by simulation. The blue is the upper bound and the green is the lower bound. So that's our approach. And the black is what this paper is proposing as an upper bound only and only for k equal 1. What you notice is that we get a tighter lower bound, but also we have a lower bound. And what is more interesting, as k increases, when you go for the second best, third best, where the other approach fails, or actually is not even attempted, uh, our bounds become tighter and tighter, which was a little bit even a surprise for myself, because, uh, you know, as I said, we are using two bounds, the Jensen followed by uh, a bound on the order of random variables, but still, in many configurations, we are able to get quite interesting, uh, basically, and tight results on the bounds of this uh, ordered uh, random uh, capacity, uh, ordered capacity. Now, this approach has been extended to another letter actually also was accepted, where basically we are accounting now for the chance data formation availability of the transmitter. It gets a little bit more messy, but nonetheless, these are still very simple expression that are function only of the quantile function and <coughs> formula that are function of n, k, and gamma naught. So, and the, 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 the bound are again quite tight. This, the paper that I propose, uh, the 2009 paper that I talked about earlier, this one, uh, didn't even look at this aspect of chance data formation availability at the transmitter. Uh, but we looked at that and we are able to get uh, quite interesting and tight bounds that are actually quite tight in the sense that they can differentiate at low SNR between the availability of the SNR, uh, availability of the chance state information at the transmitter uh, uh, or not. So, 
The last problem uh, within this context of exact capacity calculation, so uh, ca 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 capacity calculation, so the first problem or set of problems were asymptotes. The second was bounds. And the third is an exact computation. This one is a little bit in all the results, two years ago, but I just want to include this presentation to tell you sometime it's also interesting to look at exact results. And this, uh, this is basically if you are trying to look at the performance of equal gain combining or maximum ratio combining. This formula is an end-to-end SNR at the end of the diversity combiner as a function of P and Q. When you set uh, here P equal 1 and Q, Q equal 2, you get an equal gain combiner. When you set uh, P equal 2 and Q equal 1, R being kind of, uh, if you will, in the context of uh, FSO can be irradiance or fading amplitude, in the context of RF, you get basically uh, an MRC kind of receiver. And the question is, uh, or the kind of motivation was to try to compute uh, exact capacity results uh, when the R follow different kind of distribution, not necessarily identical distributions. And to do that, we basically uh, devised, and uh, this is Yilmaz Ferkhan, used to be a postdoc in my group, he kind of devised an equivalent representation of log 1 plus XQ that is in desired form in the sense that basically the X appears in the exponential argument and as such, when you do averaging, you end up with an expression that can be expressed as a homogeneity function. Those of you who have been do doing some work on the beta rate calculation using MGF approach, you know how, how important is the MG, uh, this representation of the Q function to be able to compute MGF-based approach for probability of error. Everything you are able to do for beta rate, you can do now for capacity because we have a desired representation for the log 1 plus x in the form of a derivative of exponential, which means all the results that we are able to obtain are, uh, uh, previously can be obtained as derivative of MGF. And uh, you know the, the details are given in this paper. And uh, we are able to, 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 to specialize the results for the case of MRC. This function, that what we call CQ of S here, the auxiliary function, is a basically a very simple exponential integral function in the case of maximum ratio combining, and cosine integral function in the case of equal gain combining. So I want to go a little bit fast on this topic. Just the message I would like to convey is because I think most people are familiar with beta rate computations using the MGF approach that has been quite popular over the last uh, you know, years. But everything you're able to do with beta rate, you can do now with capacity because we have this desired representation of log 1 plus x. And the results are, of course, exact and uh, have been checked by simulation for accuracy. Now, I would like to conclude maybe with two or three final results. Uh, the first one is going back to this uh, unified expression for the PDF. You can also try, instead of finding capacity, try to find beta rate probability. So this is a formula also for the probability of error for binary modulation called the Wojnar formula. It, it combines in a single formula the probability of error for DPSK and BPSK. So the, if you put, for example, P equals 0, 0,5 and Q equals 0, 0,5, you get basically a Q function. Whereas if you put, for example, p equal 1 and q 0, 5, you get an exponential function. So this formula is valid for both. The incomplete gamma function can become a q function and it can become an exponential function. So it's a compact expression that basically gives you the binary probability of error of a variety of modulation schemes. Now, you want to get a unified formula for the probability of error, uh, not only for binary modulation, but uh, over FSO links. You need to basically average that over the CDF we obtained previously. And interestingly enough, Enough, this formula can be obtained in closed form. And as I told you earlier, if you use the asymptotic representation of the G function, you can write your expression in a very simple form as coding gain gamma bar to the power diversity gain, where the diversity gain is just the minimum of epsilon uh, C square R and beta R. And that's basically your coding, uh, your diversity gain, sorry. And the coding gain is just a function of uh, simple terms involving the parameter of the modulation. And these are channel parameters because these are coming from the argument of the G function. So again, the fact that you have an expression of G function is a really a good uh, way to start uh, getting simple asymptotic results that are quite accurate. If you notice here, we are plotting again for different kind of uh, pointing errors. Uh, the exact results are you know uh, in solid line the asymptotic results are uh, are given uh, i guess in a dashed line here and you see that asymptotic results uh, above 20 db or so start matching perfectly the exact results 
Okay, now let me conclude with two maybe uh, very simple results. Hopefully we remind you some of the classical results that we have seen in some time undergraduate communication uh, theory. So if I ask you what are the simplest formula for the simple error probability of MPSK? MPSK, you know, like uh, MRE phase shift king. There are many papers, uh, like uh, starting from uh, books, uh, giving complicated formulas. The simplest formula uh, to my best knowledge, have been published in the transactional communication by Pavula. Okay, so this is you know an author who is quite good. Have been published even with Rice. Uh, he had paper with Rice in the 60s. Uh, now, one of his last paper was in 99, where he he developed this very simple formulas for MPSK. Uh, and MDPSK, so differential PSK and MRE PSK. And why we're interested in that? Because we wanted to, because uh, always this question FSO is, should we go non-coherent? Should we go differentially coherent? Should we go coherent? What is the gain by going, by knowing the, uh, the phase or not? So, for example, it is well known in AWGN that asymptotically at high SNR, the difference in performance gain between uh, differential coherent and coherent is negligible. It's nearly go to zero. Whereas in Rayleigh fading, the difference is always 3 dB. So basically, roughly, when you plot the performance of MPSK and MDPSK in Rayleigh fading, you will find that high SNR, a 3 dB gap, which is different than AWGN which means the fading, the multiplicative effect, is basically a major kind of factor in determining how much gain you get into uh, between differential and, uh, and, and coherent. So the question, like in the context of, uh, in the context of uh, FSO, was what is really uh, the diver uh, what is the not diver what is the performance gain that you get by getting into coherent versus differentially coherent so there is this general result uh, that we were able to derive with collaborators uh, uh, you know hong uh, shuan yang uh, basically the result is like this uh, this is uh, if you will, uh, I will show you what I mean. What, 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 uh, actually, this is uh, with Julien, actually, not uh, Yang, sorry, Julien Shang. So this is what I'm trying to quantify. So uh, I'll go to the curve later on, but this is 16 PSK and this is 16 differential PSK. The question we're asking ourselves, what is this SNR gap? At high enough SNR or at low enough beta rate, is this 2 dB, 3 dB, whatever, what, what is this SNR gap? Now, the formula we derive is exactly this. This formula is telling you this. For a channel with a diversity order T plus one, for example, really fading, you know, it will be one diversity order, right? So T equals zero. Basically, the SNR gap between MDPSK and MPSK is 10 divided by T plus one, log of G divided by H, where G is a just function of M, it's just an integral that you can compute, and theta is a variable of integration, so it goes away, and the upper limit is function only of M, and so is H, depends only on M. Okay? Now, for the log normal fading, you can do further simplification, and if you ignore some terms, at high enough SNR, you have this interesting results. Log normal shadowing, log normal fading for FSO, log normal shadowing for RF, if you will, the SNR gap is 10 log 1 plus cosine pi over M. So what does it mean? Let's say m equal 2. So pi over 2 equal what? Cosine pi over 2. Zero. zero. So log of 1 is 0. Which means at high enough SNR, what this formula is predicting is that m, uh, sorry, differential PSK, binary differential PSK, and BPSK should be one on the top of, each, uh, of the other. And that's pretty much true. If you look here at the crosses or x's, you see solid x and dash x, they are getting closer and closer to each other. Which means there is no much difference between differential phase shift king and binary phase shift king in log normal fading environment. However, if you keep increasing m, let's go m goes high. At the end, cosine pi over m can be equal to two, right? one, right? So log of two is 0.3, 10 log of 0.3 is three dB. Which means that the gap eventually for high modulation order is going to be 3 dB. And that's what we observe. For log normal fading or log normal shadowing, for differential phase shift king, the differential gain or the gain by going to coherent is negligible if you are in the binary case. If you go for MRE case, then the gain goes to 3 dB like a Rayleigh fading, which is different than the behavior of Rayleigh fading. 
which is, you know, it's a finding, a quite interesting finding, but uh, as far as we know, no one has observed that before. So, we, and this was, of course, if you plot that, you'll see it, you know? So this is not like, I mean, you plot it, you'll see it's not nothing different. We are not, uh, it's very simple, just plot. Uh, but, but the only problem is, uh, these are simulation, huh? or, or, or if you, the, there is no closed form expression for, as I told, log normal, you cannot compute closed form, because you can, you don't, we don't know how to integrate log norm over log norm distribution. So either you compute numerically, or you do simulation. But this result is an exact result, asymptotic exact result. And if you want to look at the corresponding results uh, for Rayleigh, it was in, a, in 1990 by, by this guy, Ekanayaki in TCOM 90, where he shows that it's 3 dB for Rayleigh fading. Okay? And uh, for log normal, the formula is a little bit more interesting in the sense it is M dependent, and it depends on if you are in binary. And, and of course, with this formula, you can do all kinds of fading distributions, gamma, gamma. You can find diversity order of gamma, gamma, which is minimum of alpha and beta. And you can compute this SNR gap for gamma, gamma, for example. OK, and this is the last uh, kind of result I would like to show. Uh, this is another kind of uh, set of problems. Uh, again, as I told, my interest in looking at this problem is to find new performance analysis results. This work is with uh, Hamza. Hamza is actually also another student from Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, he joined like maybe two or three years ago the group. I think Tarak knows him also. He took many of his courses. A very interesting student who was able to find, I think, I hope you will appreciate the result he was able to, to find. So uh, one of, why, why did we start to this problem? We are trying to look at, uh, we said, okay, we played quite a bit, not only ourselves, but many of uh, the community with this multiplicative fading. So gamma, gamma, log normal, Rayleigh, and you know, we, can, we can keep listing the list of distribution that has been using as a multiplicative uh, fading factors. Not as much work has been done on the additive part. So we always assume Gaussian noise, right? That's always our first assumption. Gaussian noise, you condition the Gaussian, and then you average over all kind of other distribution. Now, few papers have been published recently saying that in FSO, the noise may not be Gaussian. The noise may be Laplacian. And actually, that's FSO, but also if, uh, I don't know, Mohammed, if you, know, you followed some of the paper norm, Norm Beaulieu, has been working quite a bit on multiple access interference. And often, multiple access interference is not well modeled by a Gaussian distribution. It is more picky and is more modeled by a Laplace distribution. And I, I hope you all remember, you know what is Laplace distribution. So Gaussian is exponential minus x squared. Laplace is exponential minus absolute value of x. And it tends to be, you know, like decreasing uh, faster. So the problem we ask ourselves, okay, let's change the additive Gaussian noise by an additive Laplacian noise. And let's try to see what kind of performance do we get. We start with very simple distribution, uh, sorry, very simple modulation like BPSK and QAM and PAM, and we're able to find some interesting results. But the most interesting result, I think, came when we looked at the PSK case. So the problem at hand is the following. The problem at hand is, let me submit an MPSK, but it's affected or corrupted by Laplacian noise. And we have two questions that we're asking ourselves. The first question, what is the performance of MPSK over Laplacian noise with and without fading? And the second question, which is as important, if not more important, what is the optimal detector for this kind of, uh, the, you know, kind of uh, communication setup? So the answer is, First of all, the optimal detector is not anymore the so-called L2 norm detector, because it's not anymore Gaussian noise. It is rather an L1 norm detector, absolute value. And in this case, the decision region are not the same anymore. These are the decision region we typically use when we have an MPSK, right? For Gaussian noise, and we all know that. If you have Laplacian noise, then you have to use an L1 minimum distance detector, and in this case, Believe it or not, basically the decision region becomes of this shape. Just slightly different, right, than this shape. Now, it turns out, so that answers the first question. The maximum likelihood detector is, gives you this kind of detector or this kind of decision region. So the second question we ask ourselves, now what's the performance of MPSK over this kind of channels? With and without fading. But the fading has always come after averaging, so it's easy. Let's start without fading. Now, the first uh, kind of problem encountered is that computing the probability of error with this kind of decision region was not very easy. Especially if you want to have generic expression. When I say generic, it's generic in M. We don't want to say, what's the performance of 8 PSK? I want to find the performance of M PSK for an arbitrary M. 
So the approach that we used to solve this problem was first to assume that basically this problem is going to be difficult, let's start with this problem, which means implicitly what we are assuming, we assume that we think that the noise is Gaussian and we'll be using a Gaussian detector, but actually the signal is going through a Laplacian noise. So it is a mismatch between what the symbol is observing in reality and what we are trying to detect. And we felt that this way at least we'll be able to get some simple closed form expression, and that's true. Now, just to tell you, uh, you know, of course, this is a bivariate Gaussian, that's a bivariate Laplacian. They are both symmetric, but basically, you know, they are different. Uh, you know, this is like an L2 norm, this gives to an L1 norm, so obviously that's why decision regions are different, and that's why it leads to this decision region. And actually, yeah, that's something else that Hamza did that I quite interesting. Uh, is he, what he tried to show here is the overlap or difference between the two uh, regions. So, for instance, if you get the symbol green here, you see? Now, if you use, uh, the, of course, uh, the, 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 the L2 detector, you will decide S1. Whereas if you use uh, the L2, the, the, the L1 detector, you will use, you will de decide S2, right? And that's why the two detectors will not give you the same uh, results. And that's what he's trying to kind of uh, illustrate here with the symbol A here. So, of course, the probability of error of these two detectors is going to be different because the decision regions are different. Now, so basically, step number one, what he was able to compute quite nicely, I would say, is basically a closed form expression for the probability of error with the L2 norm detector, which is easier to compute. It's generic in M, it's function of this function I, and this function, so it's function of nothing. If you look at this formula, it's function of only M, which is the uh, order of the constellation, and then G uh, tangent G and I. G is here, and G is function of I. So what is I? I is a very simple expression that basically is channel fading dependent. If you have no fading, it's just exponential minus x divided by the SNR, square root of SNR. The more you complicate the fading, Rayleigh, Nakagami, Gamma Gamma, like or, or EGK, which is even more complicated than Gamma Gamma, you end up with this E function becoming more and more complicated. But it's just a function of an argument X, and everything else are parameter of the fading that is going to come into play. So basically, you can think of this expression as the, as the condition probability of error that we, are, uh, that we already averaged, and this I is the averaged kind of function over the fading. If there is no fading, it's just an exponential. If, you, if it's uh, fading, you average exponential over more complicated fading distribution, and you get, uh, anyway, a cross form expression. So that's the expression over, uh, basically, uh, 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 with an L2 norm detector, which was the easiest case. But what was more interesting, actually, and this credit goes again to Hamza, what he was able to do, and that's actually how you solve this kind of problem, from my own experience, you look at a pattern. So you start with QPSK, then you do 8PSK, then you do 16PSK, because the decision region, you start basically, and I have a previous students who did the exact same problem with hierarchical constellation a few years ago. So we use the same approach here, and basically Hamza was able to get the pattern, and he has finally an interesting closed form expression for the optimal detector, the L1 norm detector, and that's the probability of error for the L1 norm detector, which is again function only of M, of I, and its derivative I prime. And I prime, you can also take derivative of all these functions, and they are obtained in closed form. Okay? So basically, now uh, I think what is uh, surprising at the end after all these efforts, when you plot these two detector performs in no fading and in really fading condition, and you can use any fading, gamma, gamma, or anything you want. But let's start with no fading. You notice that the difference is really minimal. So, of course, for the ca case of uh, QPSK, there is no difference whatsoever because uh, the decision region are the same. But 8PSK, there is a slight difference in decision region, but the gap is minimal. And then the higher the constellation size, the gap is even smaller and smaller. Now, if you add on the top of that fading, actually the gap disappears. And this has been confirmed by simulation, which tells you that basically, you know, it's quite robust to the type of additive notion. I mean, once you have fading in particular, the fading dominates performance. The additive noise becomes whatever it's its nature, Gaussian, Laplacian. So what we are saying here, if you use a Gaussian detector for a Laplacian noise, essentially there is no much difference. The performance is the same. That's what this curve is saying. I mean, a very small difference in no fading scenario, and essentially no difference in this fading scenario. So, Basically, you know, that's 
I, I would probably conclude with that. We have a few other results on the sum of log normal. I, I will skip that and I can keep it in the slides. Oh, maybe I will, I will conclude with this. And that's probably one last slide to put FSO in the context of cellular communication. So that's one application we thought of, of trying to use basically FSO in the context of cellular communication. And the idea is as follows. FSO gives you this high uh, data link connection but is not very good from a mobility perspective. The idea is uh, to look at a femtocell concept where basically the femtocell will be equipped with a, an RF FSO converter, if you will. And the role of this RF FSO converter is to multiplex multiple RF link into a single FSO link. So if you will, one possible application of FSO in the context of cellular is Fantocell of loading, where basically you have multiple users condensed or congested in one area, hotspot, and you want to multiplex all these users eventually into a high data rate link that will connect them to a macro base station. One way to do it is a two-hop link, where the first link is going to be an RF link, and the second hop is going to be an FSO link. So obviously, from a performance analysis perspective, it gave us a nice, interesting mix, what we call that a mixed RF FSO dual hop transmission system, where you try to analyze a two-hop system where the first hop is RF and the second hop is FSO, and you are trying to look at the end-to-end -end performance of this link. <coughs> but from a performance perspective, or from an application perspective, the idea was to use this as a femtocell or as an offloading solution to be able to combine multiple RF links into an FSO. We have even extension of this work that was uh, published, in, uh, published in WCNC, uh, you know, uh, Istanbul, where basically RF link will be a cognitive link, where RF will be subject to an interference constraint so that we don't use other part of the spectrum, and the second part will be FSO. So just a natural extension of this work. And so we have some results. I would not go through these performance results. They'll be available in the links, uh, in the slides. But basically, again, we use a kind of uh, generic performance analytical tool to be able to get asymptotic results as well as exact results, accounting for different kind of diversity schemes also. So I think it's a good time to stop. And uh, I'll be happy to take some questions you know, on the various topics that were addressed here. Mohammed. You have always good questions, I know. Thank you very much. You want at the beginning, when you started uh, speaking about Laplace in noise, I, I expected that the noise will be uh, circular and the no. complex plane. I, I expected that. Yeah. But when I have seen the 8PSK, I understood that you have Laplace in for the in-phase noise, yes. Laplace in for the yes. quadrature. Yes. But uh, normally, here you have, uh, you have made a privilege for this Laplace nature, nature and uh, align, align, align this uh, distribution on the I and Q axis. Normally it should not. Why the noise, why, why, why do you want the noise to be aligned with your I and Q uh, axis? So, so, so probably... Oh, you mean like so, any rotation? Uh, yeah, I, no, not even that. Uh, I think that uh, probably uh, if, you t if you take the, the, the noise module, module to be Laplacian, probably, it's better probably. I see what you mean. Actually, yeah. No, I have. A, I think also we looked at this problem, or look, uh, you know, or incomplete, is to look at the optimal rotation. Because I agree with you. So we look at Ritteri as a noise a completely aligned with the I and Q, and I agree it can be any rotation of that. We, th we thought about it, actually, not from your perspective, we thought about it. What about, we know it is a noise, I mean, let's assume, and you would like to find the optimal rotation, theta. I mean, you can rotate the PSK as you wish. And you can develop a probability of error as a function of theta. theta. Mm -hmm. And I think. I, I, I mean, we don't have, any, uh, as far as I remember, last time I met Hamza, we don't have exact expression for this, but it's not very sensitive to theta. But everything is not sensitive to each other here. But I remember he tried for various theta, or tried to get, uh, well, I mean, the idea was to try to get the beta rate as function of theta and see if there is an optimal uh, kind of rotation that gives you minimum beta rate. And uh, as far as I remember, it was, it was not like basically obvious from simulation that there is an optimum value for rotation uh, where you get like an optimum theta for the beta rate. But, but I, it's, I think, along the same lines, what you're asking. Can we have closed form expressions when the noise is circular and the module of it in is Laplace? Is, is Laplace. Uh, yeah, we can take a look at this problem. 
I have a question about uh, uh, your capacity for low SNR uh, when you said that we have uh, uh, full SNR but uh, very low, uh, uh, full CSI but very low SNR. So I said the gain is uh, log 1 over uh, SNR. But this is more philosophical question for me because at very low SNR we cannot really have a full uh, CSI. So uh, can you give uh, something between SNR, log SNR, and so we said when you don't know CSI, the, the capacity is SNR, and when you know what you have a gain. Yeah, when well, you're not perfect. Perfectly, but, yeah, yeah. but in, in, in reality we cannot know it perfectly since is, we are very low. There is a factor. Uh, and, uh, we, we, we try to look at this problem, but in, in, in the simplistic model, when you have basically imperfect SNR knowledge, what, how the SNR capacity will scale? As far as I remember, uh, as Zuhair put this problem, is 1 minus alpha SNR log 1 of SNR, where alpha is the given idea of the quality of the estimation of SNR. But under very stiff condition, I think, is the SNR of the transmitter, like still perfect SNR of the transmitter, and sorry, of the receiver, but you have imperfect feedback, and the alpha accounts for that. So it scales as 1 minus alpha SNR log 1 over SNR, where alpha is, uh, gives you an idea of the quality of the channel estimation. If it's zero, it's perfect channel estimation. As degrades, you get basically worse and worse channel estimation. But I agree with you, it's, uh, you know, that's the key question is, Yes, you are getting this gain, but at low SNR, in general, at low SNR, you are not going to be able to accurately estimate the SNR. I agree. It's like an information. I mean, uh, we are not doing information theory per se. In our case, we are just computing things. But uh, that's a formula. And, uh, you know, yes, there is this kind of uh, problem of uh, why do you compute this low SNR capacity with full CSI when we know that CSI is hard to compute or hard to acquire at low SNR. Yes. It's not a this issue. Yes. So, uh, I mean, back to the question of uh, to the case of uh, the uh, Laplacian uh, noise. I mean, uh, how, how would you explain the fact that for small size constellations, the uh, difference between Gaussian and, uh, and uh, Laplacian is not big, it seems. I mean, for, 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 yeah, it's small. And that's, that's not intuitive because, I mean, when the size is big, it's not... Uh, counterintuitive, <laughs> but the difference is zero. Uh, and, and, yeah, I think uh, so. The question is let me try to answer what you are saying. Why do we have here a bigger gap and then go smaller and smaller? Right? No, no, the fact that it goes smaller is, is, is intuitive. Okay, the fact that uh, fade dominates also is intuitive. Okay, uh, what is intuitive, what is non, not intuitive, okay, is the fact that when the size of the constellation is, is small. The, the gap is actually uh, very small. Like here? Yes. I, should, I, I would have expected something bigger. I, yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. <laughs> We're trying to explain that by looking at this. Uh, maybe we should do that for, uh, no, that's already for an 8 PSK. These are the region where we have a you know, difference, right? That's mm. like the gray region are the only region. And this region, I mean, apparently is not, you know, it's not having a big impact on the difference. These are the only, now every, all the white region will have the same decision, right? Regardless of the detector you use. The only region we're going to have a difference in detection decision is the gray region. And the, uh, it seems and the, the surface of, the, of those are bigger when the, uh, uh, the size of the constellation is smaller. That's probably, that's that's definitely, what that's, that's what's happened. I mean, we are just. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's too small. That's what <laughs> we can conclude out of the curves, but I mean, a priori, I don't know if one can guess that. Okay. But the area is getting smaller as n increases. The area mm. of the ambiguity or of the difference between the two detectors is getting smaller, relatively mm. speaking. The most important uh, uh, gray area is the, is the one that is near, near to the samples. Because yes. there, there the, the, the problem density of the noise is the, the highest. Highest. Mm. The highest. And here, as you see, there is some compensation. There is some, something going up yes, and yes. something going inside. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Second, second well, uh, we're trying to explain. I mean, this, mm. this kind of figure came out of trying to explain why we got. I mean, Great. We, we were actually hoping, actually, because we, opt we obtained the optimal detector and the optimal the, the closed door, that there should be some difference. But actually, the difference is really minimal. Mm. But this SNR, is it EB over N0 or is it SNR? It's SNR. No, because it's similar probably. Mm. Oh, oh, it's not oh, bigger. Oh. So it's similar probably. Okay. Mm. When you have a coded system, is there more, more impact? 
no intro of Wikipedia. Laplace with Laplace? No, no. Laplace is no. Actually, uh, I mean, uh, I was surprised myself to see that there is very little work on additive Laplace in Mars. I mean, one may think... Uh, Maybe because we think, yeah, I mean, everybody thinks that the worst noise is Gaussian. Yeah. I don't know, yeah, maybe, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but, but basically, the, we, we looked actually at what we call generalized Gaussian. You know, generalized Gaussian is basically a generalization of Gaussian and Laplace. So it's basically exponential minus x to the power alpha. Uh, absolute value of x to the power alpha. So in alpha equal 2, you get Gaussian. In alpha equal 1, you get uh, Laplace, actually, with absolute value. And anywhere, uh, not one or two, you get what we call generalized Gaussian. So for generalized Gaussian, we cannot solve for NPSC. Because you need to get the, in closed form the sum of two Laplace, which you can do in closed form. But we don't have the closed form expression for the sum of two generalized Gaussian. That's why we could not solve the problem. Before, when you look at, the, we wrote some paper on MQAM and MPAM and BPSK, we have a closed form expression for basically generalized Gaussian. But they are simpler in the case that the decision regions are the same because it's rectangular for MPA, for MQA, for Gaussian and, and Laplace. But for MPSK, we are not able to do the generalized Gaussian case, Laplace. But what I'm trying to say is very limited work has been done on additive noise. Most of the work has been Gaussian noise. Yeah, I, I have a the question that's about um, when you, uh, the two bounds that you obtain mm -hmm. by using Jensen inequality. And, uh, and the bound on the one. Yes, so, so you have two suboptimalities, I mean, in principle. Yes, two bounds. <laughs> uh, and actually, when the order of the, uh, I mean, fifth best, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, third yeah. best, etc. I mean, the, the bounds seem to. And, and I'm, set, I'm set myself surprised too, but that's, I'm presenting a result that we are obtained. You know, these uh, results. So, I mean, Hawaii, we're using Jensen equality, we're using a bound on the order and the variables. Mm -hmm. Still, the bound are quite tight. And for variety of fading, these are valid, by the way. So, these formulas are generic. These are terms of the quantile. So, you can pick any fading you want and use it. We use log normal, we use gamma gamma. And, you know, it, it tends to, to give some good results. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, but I, I have one question about this also, this uh, bounding technique. Have you considered the scaling? I mean, wh what scaling results you get for the second and third, you know, based on these bounds? So to let, uh, to, to let N go to, in, uh, to be, become very large. Okay, now that's a different topic. Actually, when you look at this paper, that's, I think, a good question. I don't know, are you familiar with this paper or not this one? This paper? No. No. Okay. So the pa this paper has two parts. He has one part where he do this bound, and he has one part about scaling. And by scaling, they go to extreme value theory, right. okay. where they show that basically the distribution of the max go to a gamble distribution. Okay. Right. Okay. A gamble yeah, distribution. Yeah. So actually, we have a generalized result, not ours. I mean, we found actually the result they have here that turns out to be a quite simple result in the old statistical literature, and there are some results on gamble or generalized gamble for the f second best, third best, fourth best. Okay. But they were not familiar because they really derived things that are, familiar, uh, are available in the studies literature. The problem is we could not publish this paper because it is, there is not no contribution. If you cite the, uh, the statistics paper, they have done everything. So the scaling law, which is the extreme value theory, results are available oh. for the gamble distribution, uh, or if in this case with gamble, for first, second, third best. But we are trying to, I mean, we have to do a twist to the problem to be able to use it in our context because if you use as it is, there is no contribution. Okay, but, but it's not unavailable. What I'm trying to say, the best, second best, third best, for large asymptotic results mm -hmm. are available in the old statistical literature. But can you, uh, can you get it, can you, can, you, no, can you get them from the bounds? Can you get these uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember looking at that. Okay, okay. Yes. I don't remember looking at that, but uh, I'm not sure it's the same yes. kind of approach. But of course, they will match. But can you find them analytically? I'm not sure. Okay. But what I can, what I'm sure about, actually, there are two families of extreme values. There is the so-called uh, uh, Gumbert, and there is a Frechet, not our Frechet, not oh. Frechet distribution. <laughs> okay. So depending on the kind of distribution we deal with, in fading, as long as you don't do ratios, all these distributions will convert. Like the best distribution will convert to a gamble distribution. Okay. The second best will be like generalized gamble that is available. Okay. But when you look at, for example, where, this is where we are using extreme value, ratio, cognitive ratio. 
where you have, for example, SANRs. Then you have ratio of two random variables. These kind of distribution will converge to the Frechet distribution. Okay. And this, there, there is a little bit more contribution from our perspective because the results have to be easily manipulated to, to be able to put them in a cognitive setup. And that's where we are doing some work now. Okay. But on this one, we were not able to do anything because, as I said, I can show you the papers. Mm. As it is, maybe you just use it as it is. Okay. Okay. But actually, that, so your the question is that, see what you are saying? Can you get from these bounds? In other words, if these bounds meet at the end, they should meet, they should uh, converge uh, analytically to the gamble distribution yes, yes, yes. for large k. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if you check that. That's yeah. uh, for, for, for large n, right? I mean, k is yeah, the for order. For large n, sorry. Yeah, yeah. For large n, I agree. Right, for right. Yes. Yeah. And that's something we can check. Yeah. Which is here. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the yeah. point. Actually, this paper is published, but we can check that. That's a good point. Thanks. Just last uh, remark. Sure. Yeah. Because from an implementation point of view, I think the L1 detector is, be, is easier yeah. than the L2 detector. And, right. and there is no big difference between the performance. Maybe in this case you showed there's a small... Yeah, the minimum here. Yeah. yeah. But even when the channel is Gaussian, we use L1 for an implementation yeah, well, sometimes. I mean, you can conclude all of you think Things. results. Are, yeah. I mean, the only point that I think is very valid is what Mohammed mentioned about the model. The model, yeah, yeah. The rotation aspect. Yeah. When I look at the rotation. And, and the decision uh, areas will be the same as the L2 detector. Mm -hmm. So it will simplify the computation of the probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's error probability. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, that's a, but if you use this model and use that as a reference point, I agree with you that the lesson you learn from all this is that at the end of the day, forget about the L1 detector, use the L2 detector, the performance is very similar, the closed form expression are similar, and there is no much difference between the performance between L2 and L1. No, for me it's different, because use L1, because L1 is, uh, is very easy to implement. Oh, I think L1, because yeah. it's the... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just addition, you don't need multiplication and so on. And one work we, we have done together with uh, ComBlock, you remember? I remember. ComBlock. Uh, the, and the implementation they use L1 norm, L1 norm, L1 norm to, to detect uh, to detect on the satellite channel, not L2 norm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just a general question. Uh, I want to know what are uh, what are the comments of the people uh, working on the optical fields when they saw such uh, such works done by uh, people from the co digital communication uh, community. I think photonics. Uh, I mean, as I said, the transaction wireless communication were trying to gain the battle and try to get back our paper there. Mm -hmm. uh, but transaction communication access paper. Transaction communication you can have paper. Com letter, wireless com letter, they can accept paper and FSO. Photonics, actually, they were quite receptive. We get like two papers and I repeat the funds photonics, and uh, photonics is quite broad. So basically, you find like uh, hardware papers, and you can find FSO papers there. So they accept it. And these, uh, GLT, actually, they are uh, actually quite selective. It's a very good journal. Huh? And, but, there, but there is also papers on, uh, I would say, GLT, the Journal of Lightweight Technology. Uh, we got one paper rejected because I think they, they, uh, they want to see more prototype. It's like the electronics, like, you know, there's a little bit of in our area, when I compare like in double E department, in double E department, like in the typical double E department, you have people in system and people more in the circuit electronics. The circuit people tend to publish much less because they usually, to publish, they have to have, it's not just a lab, they have to have a real prototype. And GLT is a little bit like that. So if you just submit equations, they will say, okay, but I mean, show me the, the, the test methods. <laughs> so they, they just don't want to see. So they, if you can reject the paper, just based on the ground. Photonics, I found a little bit more open. I triple photonics. But GLT, I, I, uh, I think the, the review comments are very much into system and prototyping and things like that. Not all, but you know, some. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Slim. Yeah, I saw the faces of our students, and they are scared by all this equation and <laughs> probability and stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, do you have a question? No, any, no questions. <laughs> uh, so we have to conclude our uh, spring school. I think I don't know Fatma and Leila, Sameer, and community. Conclusion. We said that uh, uh, the main thing today, our conclusion is the. Uh,
Je vais nous donner le café. C'est bon, quand même. Bon, I would like to thank uh, all the organization committee, our uh, three Tejia Kum and Tejia. Quel ars, quel ars, c'est mon tête de faire. Donc, uh, the organization committee led by uh, Sameh, uh, Leila and Fatma, and I want to thank to all the people, our student, uh, Marwen there, also Asma, uh, she worked too hard, Mohammed, a lot of uh, Zakia, uh, Sofiane, uh, Hela, uh, Hishem, and all the stuff. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank also our keynote speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Luc Denier, Luc Denier, uh, Awatf, Tarak, uh, Slim, Mohammed Ben Kahla, and everyone here. And uh, thank you. Hope that we will have a next session, next spring school or summer school or, or fall school. I don't know. And this topic or, or other. And inshallah, as I said, voila. So, voila, be with you. What are we going to do? Hachai? Merci à tout le monde, tous les participants. Je ne vais pas refaire le même discours. Nous vous remercions tous pour votre participation, que ce soit nos invités, nos speakers, les personnes qui ont aussi participé à l'organisation et les gens qui ont participé en tant que... qui ont profité de ces cours de très bonne qualité. Je remercie tous les speakers, encore une fois. Et mes deux collaboratrices aussi. C'est chez moi aussi. Donc, euh, je pense que c'était une première que... expérience au niveau de COSI, mais espérons que cette expérience continue avec les autres collègues et l'encouragement de, de, de tous les collègues et la motivation aussi des... Donc, il faut essayer, hein. il faut juste y croire. Exactement, donc euh, voilà, et merci, et shukran lakum. Voilà.